This is The Chris Abraham Show. Hey, welcome to season four, episode four of the Chris Abraham Show. Brand new rebranding. Welcome, welcome, welcome. It is uh, Saturday. It is uh, 10 September 2022. And I am still Chris Abraham after that sentence is over. We are in a different venue today. I am trying my best to remove the wind noise. And so I've got my... uh, recorder hidden in an upside down uh, bucket hat and you might hear cars going by. I'm at Penrose Square Park which is at the Giant and Hair Cuttery and at Penrose Square um, here near the Starbucks at the corner of Barton and Columbia Pike. So you might hear in the background, you probably will hear in the background a um, a water what is it called a um, a water feature I don't know call it a water feature it actually is one of those things for kids you know that where the water kind of you know sprays up from the from the ground and uh, kids can kind of splash through uh, the water I'm being distracted right now because there's a phenomenally beautiful woman walking by, so I apologize. I will reframe myself. Steady, steady, Mr. Abraham. And uh, no kids are here. They should be. I don't know why. There were a couple boys playing around here earlier. But so you might hear the soothing, the beautiful, soothing sound of lapping water. It is not a vigorous brook. It is not a a uh, uh, a river run by me. It is merely one of those accessible, playful water features where things bubble up from the ground. I'll talk in the next segment about the concept of being a digital nomad and working virtually because I have a lot of thoughts on these and I am getting closer to returning to that different lifestyle after having kind of lived, rooted to a place since, I dare say, uh, 2012. So, honestly, it's been 10 years that I've lived in the same uh, building, and uh, we'll see. Might be, times might be changing. I've been teasing my buddy Kay uh, about moving to uh, Mexico City ever since I've been there about 10, 15 years ago. And now apparently it's become ruined with Americans, but that doesn't stop me. What that means is that my brain will be able to take a break and there'll be a big expatriate community just like there was in Berlin. So I can decide if I want to have an expat experience with a bunch of uh, brave digital nomads or whether I want to have a legit Mexico City experience or not. I'm uh, on day 23 of my Duolingo Spanish language learning and it's really beginning to rekindle a lot of my memories from high school and uh, did I study Spanish in college? I think maybe I did. Anyway, we'll be back after the break.
My buddy Mark and I have been uh, interested in being digital nomads since college, and we were the first people that we knew who had this thing called the Ricochet, and the Ricochet was a really early uh, wireless device that you plugged into the serial port of your early laptop in the, uh, I'd say the mid-2000s. No, 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 no. No, I had this in 19... Huh. When was it? I don't know. When it first came out in D.C., both Mark and I got it. It was, um, I think it was really slow. And it was via serial port. And the only way it worked is that they hang, uh, this company called Ricochet hung up... Uh, radio uh, antennas on street lights and on uh, on street signs and on stop lights and so forth and you and they were it was only available in Virginia DC maybe not even Virginia I think it was northern Virginia DC um, Washington like Seattle and uh, San Francisco I think that was it and so I remember in, was it 19, let me find out. Ricochet. Modem. DC. Ricochet Wireless Internet Service. Here we are. So, I think it was pretty early. Here we go. I, I knew it, 1995, 1990, Metricom was founded in 1985. Uh, the uh, Cupertino, California, Silicon Valley, Santa Clara Valley, Bay Area. Let's see. Atlanta, Baltimore, Dallas. It does not include DC, but it was totally in DC. And I dare say that it was 1990. Gadzooks, let's see. Technology, equipment. It's a terrible, terrible Wikipedia thing. Here we are. It was, I don't know. It was awesome. I used it from, uh, at that point, must have been Murky Coffee or Roasters on the Hill or something like that. Used to sit outside. I was on the internet. I was um, involved very strongly uh, with um, uh, a company called The Meta Network and Artswire. I was um, creating proto websites. I was doing web development. I had a, an ADSL. Uh, from a company called, I forgot what the company is called. It's the term for when you have a, uh, a bar that nobody's supposed to know of and you give, a, uh, give a, a password to get into the bar. That was the provider. And that was awesome, but honestly, it, this um, ricochet thing gave me the ability to move all around DC. I, I've never been as portable as Mark has been, but uh, it, it allowed me to go uh, when I was doing a, a when I was doing a uh, virtual classroom for uh, the Meta Network slash Artswire on behalf of Kresa, on behalf of uh, the um, on behalf of the. Um, the school that I worked for, 
what is it called? See, this is when, I think it might be that crazy water in my head, but uh, Kalamazoo Valley Regional um, Education Authority, uh, they, I was a teacher for them online via message boards and forums in the 90s, and I went out to, uh, to Seattle and stayed for the entire summer. And I stayed at this place called the um, Tortoise Hostel, or so the Green Tortoise Hostel, the Green Turtle Hostel, and spent there for the summer. And I did coffee reviews of, um, on a, a site called calfmag.com. And I did my work and I did my teaching and I did everything via virtual world. So when Mark and I decided to start Abraham Harrison, we set up the entire company to be perfectly 100% virtual. There's actually an article that uh, Google did on us because we were one of the first most active vocal users of, um, of uh, Google Docs in the entire Google business platform. And uh, so we had an entire company, up to 25 people, working around the world um, in, I think, something like 15 different countries or whatever, doing influencer marketing and online reputation management and blogger outreach and all these other things. And we were doing this virtually. So that's why it sounds like I'm being an ass, but I haven't worked in an office aside from some random people wanting me to come into their office to work for them. Um, I haven't worked in an office since uh, 2006. And so, you know, I'm very, I'm an only child and I, I'm very much happy with my own thoughts and I never get lonely and I never get hungry for touch um, and I never get scared about being alone or I never get sick or tired or anything about spending time with myself. I mean, I have the entire, I basically have unfettered access to um, whatever is even better than the Alexandria Library uh, at my beck and call, including a million different social media channels with real people on the other end, um, that it's never bothered me. I, I make a joke that might seem terrible and insulting and awful, but I didn't even notice, I didn't even notice uh, the uh, COVID-19 anything. I didn't notice it at all. Like I, I got my vaccine, I got one, but I didn't need to. Nobody ever asked me for it. Nobody ever asked me. Um, I used buffs instead of masks. Uh, nobody ever asked me unless I was going to a doctor's appointment to put on an actual mask. Um, didn't It didn't affect me at all. I don't have kids. I don't have a wife. I don't have... Um, I'm not part of dance clubs or any way, anything like this. So honestly, it was just um, a much easier environment. Fewer people out, um, always access to place at the cafe. Oh, that was another bummer. A lot of the cafes were closed and not accessible. And at that point, I just, you know, used my phone as a uh, tether or worked from home. It was really very simple to me. So. I drive Mark crazy that I haven't uh, become a digital nomad. Um, one of the reasons is, is that I've been very sick and I've been very much under earning. But, you know, things are getting better now. I've uh, got a lot of control of stuff. I'm, you know, pretty much almost at the precipice of thriving if I don't compare myself to my rich friends. And, um, it's becoming more and more interesting, more and more interesting as a thing to do. Whether that's buying a new motorcycle and uh, basically living homeless, putting all my other stuff into storage and selling and giving away like most of my pans and most of my kettle bells and that kind of thing. Or um, whether, you know, I should relocate and try out Mexico City. I mean, when I was there for a wedding, I thought it was magical and majestic and amazing and interesting and curious and so forth. And even though Mexicanos uh, feel like they're being invaded by Americanos, Americanos, I dare say that that would be really extremely fun to watch. Um, 
be extremely fun to watch the confluence of digital nomads from around the world. It would be just like all the things I really loved about Berlin. Like I had more fun. I mean, I had the most fun with um, my buddy uh, Frank Merfort and all of his uh, sexy, awesome artists. Uh, my upstairs neighbor and his sexy, awesome artists. But to be honest, most of my time was spent gallivanting uh, with all the uh, expats on that, whatever that expat message board was. Like I partied with them, I hung out with them. Everybody was like Irish or Romanian or or American or or whatnot. It was it was pretty pretty fun. Like it was fun and. Um, I never really learned a lot of German, but I feel like I'm really picking up Spanish pretty well. And I promised, I don't know when that wedding was, was it 2007? I attended a wedding down in Mexico City, but it was um, multi-generational, aristocratic, um, Mexican city uh, bourgeoisie who had the wedding. So I had this amazing like drive from here to there experience, an experience that did not submit me to anything but, you know, artist colonies and artistic areas and tourist joints and and homegrown hip places that were kind of like, you know, Mexico City versions of those amazing Cuban restaurants in Miami, you know, that are sort of for Cubanos but also for people who want to have a Cuban restaurant experience, you know, that sort of thing. They've got a lot of that going on, and like Café du Monde in, um, in uh, New Orleans. Uh, but I also hear that there's places in France that are dirt cheap, and of course uh, Portugal dirt cheap, and, and Spain dirt cheap, and anytime you get off any place where a digital nomad probably wouldn't live, it's probably more affordable. And if I do it the American style, it'd probably be just a cheap motel to cheap motel on the back of a cheap motorcycle that is big and bulky enough that cool kids don't want to steal it. And I'm even thinking about having it bespoke made so that I can carry one of my, you know, 24, 28 kilogram kettlebells as a passenger. Like, just figure out a way to fabricate... Um, a, uh, a, you know, what they call a bitch pad uh, for instead of the, the sweet okole of a, of a hot girl, it could be the sweet okole of a hot Ilaiko uh, kettlebell or a hot RKC kettlebell or a hot Kettlebells USA kettlebell or a hot Kettlebell Kings kettlebell or a hot Onnit kettlebell or a hot Rogue kettlebell, etc., etc., etc. And theoretically, you know, I can always update if I want a bigger one or whatever. And then I can design the uh, back seat for the kettlebell for a competition kettlebell. Because as long as I stick with the same brand of kettlebell, like Elico or Kettlebell USA, um, they'll all fit no matter what weight. And I, you know, of course, would make sure the superstructure, I'm really tempted, guys, and I don't want to lose my man card, but I'm really tempted for uh, to get a a uh, Goldwing uh, full dresser Goldwing from the 80s or 90s, and like making that my my uh, North American rock star rocket ship, and maybe you know visit Canada, maybe go down and visit, go down and see if I don't get kidnapped and killed on the way down to. Um, Ciudad de Mexico and do that sort of thing because I mean I own like five Lenovo X220 uh, ThinkPads circa 2011 2012 and I keep on buying refurbed ones off of eBay and lately I've been installing Linux on them and as a result I do not I do not really ever move into a laptop. Everything's on, you know, on Google Drive or uh, on um, whatever drive. Like, there's a million drives, OneDrive or 
on Linux, you have to rely more on Linux compatible ones. Or I've got things up on, you know, Quick Note, or it's just fantastic, right? So, and I'm pretty ephemeral when it comes to this kind of content. Like, I don't really keep it. What I do is I upload it to uh, Anchor in this case, and then uh, it exists, and then more likely than not, I just delete the source files. I mean, I don't really, I'm not like one of those rock stars like Seth, Seth James Damore or Kofuzi or Ginger Run or whatever who has everything organized that they can, you know, do uh, Back to the Future episodes where they go back and take pictures from five years ago or ten years ago. As you know, this is just free association. So, but it's really awesome. I think it's really super awesome, this digital nomad thing. I've kept my head down because I know that it messes with pricing. I mean, even when I was in Berlin, I was, you know, better off than most, you know. I, the quality of life that Berliners have, based on how much they don't earn, is phenomenal. You, you could end up partying and drinking beer and going out and going to, to venues and going... Like with people who are making almost no money. Uh, the quality of life is phenomenal. There's a lot of things that are just really cheap. And if that's even more profound around the world, then, you know, so be it. I just need to make sure that I either get healthy enough to be able to get off of my medications or uh, find a way to, if when I move to Mexico City, see her, I, I said it, when I move to Mexico City or wherever, that I make sure that I find a really good cardiologist or whatever to, to you know, keep track of me uh, retail. Like just hire someone, you know, um, out of my pocket. Um, have, you know, have insurance, of course, for catastrophic things, but to make sure that I uh, make sure that I get a um, cardiologist that is a concierge program or whatever, and he can keep me, you know, updated with, with, uh, with drogas and all that other fun stuff. So, what do you think? I mean, it's becoming more accessible than ever, and I'm feeling more and more trust with regards to my setup now. Like, 90% of all my income at present is from contracts on Upwork. And every time a contract ends, I add $20 an hour to it. I mean, I think that if I could, you know, reliably uh, fill 40-hour weeks with, you know, $100, $120 an hour, I think that I could, you know, live la digital nomad vita uh, pretty hip and happening. I mean, it seems like at that point, uh, the world is your oyster. You know, wherever you go, you can get a gym membership, wherever you go, you can get a kettlebell or a Concept 2. Um, it's not like the, you know, it's not like there's not CrossFit, you know, everywhere in the world now. It's not like everywhere in the world doesn't have uh, some dude who sells, uh, you know, who resells Concept 2 rowing ergometers. It's the kind of thing where uh, there's been so much globalization and normalization throughout the entire world that you can literally have your sexy South Arlington lifestyle no matter in the world where in the world you choose um, more likely in you know main cities but um, my friend Kay uh, is always telling me that you know when you get into the city centers of any Latin American Central American South American uh, Portuguese American, uh, even Mexican city, uh, there are super rich neighborhoods and with, with services that need to be attractive for extremely rich people. Um, gyms that, you know, use biometrics and bring you water and towels. Like, if you can claw into uh, the world of aristocracy as a digital nomad, then you can have whatever uh, experience wherever you want it probably uh, maybe not you know a tenth of the cost but uh, a third if not a half of a cost and that's still 50% off 
anybody would consider 50% off to be to be a deal, right? If uh, if my rent is $1,600 a month, that means $800 if unless I upgrade. If um, if you're from Manhattan and you're paying four grand for a two bedroom, if you're paying two or one grand in Ciudad de Mexico, then that sounds pretty good, right? Anyway, um, this was a junk one. I'm still gonna upload it because I want this to be, I don't wanna be self-censored. I wanna continue uploading and uploading and uploading. I'll get back to you after the break. So there's this beautiful Albanian couple that lives in the neighborhood and they're, they live at all the coffee shops, they live at Idito's, they live at Starbucks, they live at this uh, cafe here with the, um, um, you know, uh, Penrose Square uh, Park with all the uh, French inspired um, hunter green powder coated two tops and the uh, hunter green powder coated cafe chairs, you know the ones from Paris and uh, beautiful couple and he chain smoke like, like an Albanian immigrant and they're super cool, super sexy, super hip, super nice, a little shy. Uh, it's taken a couple few years for me to befriend them and now we say hello brother, hello brother. Uh, they're, um, I, I know he's Islamic. I think she or her, I met her sister, they have, they have crosses, I don't know, very confusing. Maybe it's a cross belief couple, but they had a premature baby at four pounds, uh, four ounces, and I'm four pounds, six ounce premature. So I really connected them over that, over that. And um, the child was in the NICU forever and ever and ever and ever, and it was very, I'm, I'm they were very friendly. They treat me very friendly and very um, formally. And uh, everything turned out well, inshallah. And uh, so I get to meet the baby, uh, his wife's uh, sister, who's a spinning image of her, uh, came in from Albania and uh, hung out for a month. And now she needs to go back to work, but she doesn't want to go back to work. She wants to take care of her baby. So uh, mommy is going back to Albania for two or three or four months uh, to be with the larger family, to be with the in-laws, to be with the parents, to be with the sisters. Um, and and to uh, many, you know, it takes a village to raise a child while daddy's going to stay here. And daddy's very sad about it, but thinks it's for the best. Um, the reason why I bring it up is because in my head, since I'm 52, all I can think about is how sad it'll be that they'll be so far apart uh, for months and months during the baby's, you know, first three, first, uh, you know, um, first three or four months away from daddy. I mean, with this amazing posse of people to love and adore uh, the baby, but um, and then I remembered. It's not, uh, it's not 19, you know, 70, it's not 19, it's not April, May, or June 1970 when I was a little premature kid. If my parents had moved me to Hawaii, they did me to move, move me to Hawaii uh, right after my birthday. So it must have been April of 1976. And honestly, you basically were on a, you were on a, a freaking capsule to freaking Mars, man. You literally only had access to um, 
all you had access to. I guess, I guess you could write people um, a wire, but all you had access to was long distance calls, which were extremely expensive. Um, and you have access to, to, uh, to letter writing or post code, code, postcard writing. So, and now my building is filled with immigrant families and they're almost constantly they're constantly on a on a um, on an app based phone call whether it's visual or on their headset whether it's whatsapp or signal or or whatever the cool kids are using um, telegram uh, it's it's incredible like you can literally if you invest in two um, pro iPads or if you invest in two of those Facebook um, you know screens you can be connected to each other uh, 24 hours a day basically make it as if there's a an inconvenient um, window between you and them with a with with a with a with perfect audio. You could do all these things for no money. All you need to do is have access to, for literally no money, you can go to a Starbucks or use public Wi-Fi or whatever, and you can be in constant touch with someone. You just can't touch them. The only thing you can't do is touch and snuggle and kiss and love and, and smell and so forth. And for people who aren't me and who don't have aphantasia, um, all y'all really need a lot of like scratch and sniff. You need smell-o-vision. You guys just aren't okay with seeing someone or talking on the phone with them. All y'all really need the smell-o-vision experience. So um, even though he can constantly see his baby for hours every day and coo at them and talk to them and so forth, and don't forget children that young have don't have Im image permanence and can't really see anyway. He can be a constant part of his child's life in almost in, in HD uh, with stereo, with Adobe stereo. Not Adobe, it's not Adobe, it's a, a Bobi with a, Adobe, a, a Mobi stereo. And uh, that's better than I had it, man. At six years old, everybody was gone. It's as if there's a lot of a difference. Between, there's more in common, don't forget, you know, between, I heard the thing, right? Like 50 years, 50 years before 1970 uh, was frickin' 1920. So I had more, in I was more related to, if you will, closer to 1920 than I was 2022 or equal distance, right? So all that's very interesting and I think it's very interesting and there's no reason, now that you get a taste for virtual working or being a digital nomad, there's no reason not to do it. Uh, you should do it, unless, of course, you really like being part of a team. And if you're a people person, if you need validation, if you need motivation, if you're not self-motivated, if you are, a, if you are, a, if you, if you desire positive reinforcement, if you. If you love coach more than anybody, if you're not a self-starter, if you're the kind of person that needs a trainer, that kind of person may be in office is your future forever. But I think that um, all the possibilities now of just living in the wind is so, so great. I need to figure out that if I move to someplace else around the world, I know I can't move to Russia because I know that any place that uh, that the powers that be uh, globally hate on are hereby uh, kicked out of the world of being able to make money uh, from Upwork. But as long as I find a place that's perfect, can I still make my U.S. dollars with my U.S. bank and my U.S. company number, my EIN? If I live anywhere else in the world, does it really matter? Because my company lives in Delaware, am I technically always in Delaware, no matter where my employee, Chris Abraham, is? I'd really need to know that. Anyway, um, I didn't mean to have this entire second podcast, but I will go on to the closing remarks.
Welcome back, welcome back, welcome back. This is the Chris Abraham Show. Please forgive me if I call it Chris Cast because it's the Chris Abraham Show, nay, Chris Cast. Nay! And this is how you reach me. Chris at Abraham.su ChrisAbraham.com Twitter.com slash ChrisAbraham Instagram.com slash ChrisAbraham YouTube.com slash ChrisAbraham Facebook.com slash Chris Abraham, Calendly.com slash Chris Abraham slash 15, uh, plus 1202-352-5051 gets you a ignored phone call. It gets you um, an ignored text unless you say something more than, hey, what's up? You need to give me full context. Uh, it gets me on Telegram and Signal and WhatsApp and all that stuff, I guess. Um, Oh, what else? I don't know. Anchor.fm slash Chris Abraham is the home base for this podcast. And uh, I love you. Thanks for being here. This is really number two episode of the Chris Abraham show. I personally think it sucked. It's probably really noisy and shitty, but like I said, you're going to get it all. I'm never going to edit. I'm never going to... Uh, delete and start over unless there's a technical difficulty. And uh, a tout à l'heure. Auf Wiedersehen. Ciao. Hasta luego. Hasta mañana. Um, bon voyage. Bon courage. Um, a, a biento. A demain. Aloha and mahalo nui loa. Oh, thank you. Thank you for listening to The Chris Abraham Show. Make sure you subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Until next time.